Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, before I get going, well, first of all, it's always hard to follow sex. When I saw this speak, the title of the previous speaker's presentation, I thought, oh. So a couple of housekeeping things. I, um, it's hard for me to stand still, but I'm only five foot one. I am wearing heels today, but I'm still not the world's tallest person. So I won't go down there because I, I had a complaint when I spoke at a, an event earlier this week that no one could see me. <laughs> Nothing worse than just a screen and a voice, right? It's like the Wizard of Oz. Um, before I get going, I'd uh, just like to get a sense of who's in the audience. How many people here are on Facebook? So you're Canadian. Is this by and large a Canadian audience? That's a typical reaction in Canada. Um, it doesn't happen everywhere in the world. Uh, we, are, we were the place of tipping point for the astronomical growth that Facebook has uh, benefited from over the last few years. So that's good because I'm hoping that most of what I say, I'm, I'm, this is a very strategic conversation. Um, well, it's not really a conversation, it's a presentation, but there will be an opportunity for questions later. But, but I do want to make, I did want to make sure that I was speaking at an appropriate level for the audience. So uh, thank you again for inviting me this morning and for giving me your attention and time. The title of this presentation is Connecting the World. Wow, that's, that's a very, very big statement. Um, and it's something that we take seriously, even though we're not an ISP, that kind of sounds like an ISP thing. But before we, we talk and we get into how marketers can benefit from Facebook, we're, we're gonna take a step backward. Can anybody guess, does anybody know who this photo is of? Did I hear it from anybody? It's Marshall McLuhan, right, woohoo. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, there's no trademark infringement there at all. Mar why, why would I have a photo of Marshall McLuhan up to start a presentation about Facebook? Yes, very good. Um, and, and also, you know, this clearly is not Mark Zuckerberg, so I probably should be starting with a photo of Mark Zuckerberg. But the reason I've got a photo of, of Marshall McLuhan up is because at Facebook, we actually are very inspired by Marshall McLuhan. And I'm now going to attempt to um, connect to a video about the, the Global Village that will really set the theme for how much of what Facebook and social media is all about is actually rooted in the past. The uh, Global Village is a world in which you don't necessarily have harmony. You have extreme concern with everybody else's business and much involvement in everybody else's life. It's a sort of Ann Landers column writ large. And uh, it uh, doesn't necessarily mean harmony and peace and quiet, but it does mean huge involvement in everybody else's affairs. And so the global village is as big as the planet and as small as uh, the village post office. So that's kind of a powerful statement. As big, oh. That's interesting, sorry about this. As big as a planet and as small as the global, as the local post office, that is very much what Facebook is like. And if you think about your own experiences on Facebook, the things that matter to you most are your friends, any groups or fan pages that you fanned or are part of, but you're part of something bigger. So while there is this global village, there's also that little post office or your piece of Facebook. And that's what social media is really about. Marshall McLuhan also famously said that media is an extension of man. And that's really powerful and important because if it's an extension of ourself, we think about what makes us human. Part of what distinguishes human beings from other animals is the fact that we communicate. Communication and the social nature of communication is a defining human characteristic. And what's exciting right now is that even though humans have always communicated, I mean, here's some example of, of different ways we've communicated throughout history. Cave walls, papyrus, newspapers, etc. Over time, the speed at which we can communicate has been driven by technology. And technology has enabled us to get better and faster. So really today what I want to talk to you about is what does all this mean to you? Communication, Social media, how do you make it profitable? 
because there is a massive sea change happening right now, driven by technology. And before I can answer those questions, we're going to take a look at three simple things. And this is essentially the agenda for my presentation. The first is the evolution of something that we call the authentic web. I'm going to explain what that is. The second is the business model for the social web. And the third is the key to social marketing. So we'll give you some strategic, some, some strategic advice. So let's take a look at how things have changed. I think you'd agree with me that from the beginning, business needs have always been fairly straightforward. You either produce a service or a product, and then once that's produced, you want to go out and make sure that everybody knows about it. You want to reach out there, get people aware of your product, so you turn to advertising. And in the past, marketers and advertisers have leveraged whatever technology was available to them. So in the beginning, it might have been you know, the print, medium, and eventually that became more sophisticated where you could identify by FSAs, you could break things down by sections of newspapers or magazines, etc. But the speed and the complexity of media has absolutely exploded. And with the advent of television, there was also the decrease of the cost of printing. The execution became more sophisticated, marketing became part science, part art. And then the digital revolution happened. And I remember working for a newspaper company and, and, and we all freaked out. Oh my gosh, this internet thing, what are we going to do? And I loved it. So one day I quit my job. I worked for Southern Newspapers and I went to work at AOL. And my boss said to me, what are you doing? How are they ever going to pay you? You know that internet thing, that's not going to be around very long. So, you know, I guess I made a really smart decision. That was way back in 1995. I was employee number 12 at AOL. So I've believed in this medium for a long time. And one of the things that got everybody excited at the beginning from a marketing perspective was this promise. The promise that the internet was going to help us leverage technology to be able to get much deeper, a much deeper relationship with customers. We were going to be able to have fabulous reporting and everybody was going to know a lot more. But what happened, as we can see on this screen, is that we ended up being very disruptive. We have screens everywhere. We have banner ads that flash and fly around and things that crawl all over our screens. We have become the masters of disruption in the digital world. And I admit my part, I'm guilty to having created part of that. But what if, instead, you looked at everything around you as a link, a communication link? And from a global perspective, you said as a marketer, OK, whether it's a handshake or a chat with a neighbor or uh, you know, even television, all of those are links that marketers have to touch people. So I'm asking you to think about that and to think that these are all touch points that as a marketer you could actually have with your potential audience. The links between these people and the things that are important to them are what we call the social graph at Facebook. So this is what the social graph looks like. And if any of you have spent any time on Facebook, the bottom of the home page, you can see links to all kinds of marketing aids. There are, all, there are references to the social graph throughout most of our material. And this is a sort of a graphic representation that we commonly use to talk about the social graph. So why do we talk about the social graph? And most importantly, why is it important? For two groups, one for marketers and the other for the audience and the users of Facebook. Bottom line is, it's really important because we are not individuals. Human beings don't just, we communicate because we're social. That is what we do. We trust and believe the word of mouth of people who are part of our social circle or people who we know at work. So we firmly believe that that word of mouth is powerful. And the social graph is a way that marketers can take advantage of that. So let's take an example. Let's say I live in, <clears throat> excuse me, I live in Toronto, for example. And if I want to look for a restaurant in Toronto, an Italian restaurant, let's say, I'm quite likely, because I'm a digital person, I'm going to go online. And how many of you have ever used the website Yelp? Anybody know what Yelp is? It's great, isn't it? So I go to Yelp, and I'm going to key in restaurants. And here's what I get back. 
There are 10 pages of results, and there are 35, almost 3,600 restaurants lifted, listed in Yelp. And for those of you who don't know what Yelp is, Yelp is a fabulous site where you can go and look at reviews by neighborhood. You can search by neighborhood, and you can see reviews of people who've gone to those restaurants. It's like the restaurant critic for the, the mass populace, if you will. But here's the challenge with that. When I go and I look at those restaurant reviews, I don't know who those people are. So essentially, I may as well just walk in. This is a picture of Young Dundas Square. Why don't I just walk into the center of Young Dundas Square and ask someone walking by, hey, what do you think about that restaurant on John and Peter? Or I'm going to Montreal. Can you tell me about this or that? Honestly, if I did that, I might get arrested. You, that, nobody behaves that way offline. And I argue and, and uh, present to you today the notion that people will stop doing that online too. They will because they don't have to anymore. So technology is changing and enabling people in a way that the web can be more relevant. We are actually experiencing a migration from what we call that internet that was information based to a web that is much more about identity and authenticity. What we do in real life is going to be reflected what we do in business connections. In other words, I'm going to provide a suggestion to someone in my circle that's relevant to me. And if they trust me and they know who I am, then they're going to take that seriously. It's evolving from an, an anonymous information-based medium to a much more personalized, and, and I would suggest to you, um, a more engaging web. So there's two things that we want to zero in from a marketing perspective. I talked about the importance of identity and authenticity. And this is important because users, and let's talk about how many users there are. On Facebook alone, there are 300 million users. In Canada, there are 12 million plus. 50% of them log on every day and spend half an hour a day with us. Why? Because they're having real conversations and it's real and it's authentic. You can tell I'm not doing well standing still here. Um, that's really important. As a marketer, you need to be aware of that. That means that you need to be authentic and you need to be real. These are real conversations and they're happening with you or without you. So the second part is understanding why this matters. So here's me on the left. See how boring and corporate I am? Here's my coworker, Jesse Dwyer. He's really cool. He actually really is cool too. It's not just a picture. So if Jesse came over and used my computer and downloaded something, and he got a message, an ad, or a pop-up, this is what it would look like to a traditional digital marketer. 204152090. It's a cookie or an IP address. That's what the, the world of the portals or search actually sees Jesse and I as. No distinction between Jesse or Louise. It's just here's this IP address or here's this cookie. And now we're going to make a set of assumptions and send a message to this IP address. So there's, there's, a, there's a ton of challenges here. And it kind of goes back to that slide I mentioned earlier where the promise of the digital landscape, the wheels start to fall off the bus right about here. If, however, we want to connect real people with real things, which I think most marketers do, because you are marketing either a real product or a real service, then you want to be able to leverage that. I'm going to show you an example of how this can be so valuable and the gold mine that's sitting out there in many ways from a marketing communication standpoint. Here's a screenshot of the NHL fan page on Facebook. And I've circled here that there are over 130,000 fans of this NHL fan page. Guess what? This is not a page run by the NHL. This is a page that a fan who feels so strongly and so connected to NHL built and reached out to his or her circle of friends, and then all of a sudden you had 130,000 people who were engaged in something. They manage it, they run it, they post. 
not their brand, but it's a conversation about the NHL that is happening. So if there was someone from the NHL here, I would say, why wouldn't you want to grab that and be part of it? Has anybody in the room had that happen with any of their brands? Because there are some really big examples of how this has happened to Canadian brands. Yes? White Swan? White, spot. White Spots, yeah. And Tim Hortons was the same thing. So this, this shows that, you know, out there in the social world, people aren't just talking about the picture from summer camp from Joey. They are talking about brands that they care about in a real way and they're real honest conversations. So the other thing that I think is really powerful is that if the NHL were involved in this, they would not only be part of the conversation, but they would be able to, in, a, in an ongoing, sustaining way, guide the conversation and inform and enrich this audience of people who have raised their hands and love this brand. But they're not there, so they can't. And what I mean by that is they could be posting comments. And when they post a comment, it's going to go viral into this world of 300 million people and any Canadian expats or hockey fanatics anywhere around the world could participate in that. So this, I think, is a really powerful example of how that brand loyalty and that honesty are happening even when the brand isn't involved. And this isn't the only example. I'm going to talk about another one later on. The other thing that I think is really cool is this didn't actually happen with the NBA or, or uh, Major League Baseball. It was only the NHL. I don't know what that says about hockey fans, but I think we can all reach the same conclusion. They're, they're super fanatical. So let's move now into the business and social web. The best way for all of you as marketers and advertisers to leverage is to understand that Facebook is not a media company. We're a platform. We are a technology platform that enables all of those conversations to take place. So what is social media marketing? Social media marketing really is a shift in behavior. We talked about it before. So 300 million people four years ago weren't on Facebook. They were searching or they were on portals, but now they are moving into this world of authenticity where they're sharing, connecting. And I put the word influencing because I think that as marketers that's really important for you to know. We saw the NHL example, but, but we see it every day. I'm sure when you go on to Facebook you see it. Sometimes the comments aren't great, but a lot of this has to do with influencing. So here's a screenshot of a Facebook homepage. I'm really glad it's not mine because I'm such a geek that mine's not very great. But I mentioned that at Facebook, we're not a media company, so we don't see this as our product. This is the end state. This is what you do. Your homepage is, you are the editor of your own homepage. Who you connect with, what you see, what you like, that's all up to you. Here's what we do. This is a fully robust version of that social graph I showed you before. And when I say it's fully robust, the thing that I really want to point out is because nobody on Facebook has a page of just friends. People who are in a social environment are engaged in things and products that they care about. So in this example, you can see that there are brands, there are dates, there are conversations. This is a big thing that's going on. It's not just an instant message between two people. And I know this kind of looks like a depiction of Superman flying around the planet, but you know what this is? This is our attempt to show you what it looks like on a daily basis. All the connections that are taking place, there are hundreds of millions, some days there are billions and billions of connections or conversations that are going back and forth across the world on Facebook, on our platform. And if any of you ever come to our head office in Palo Alto, in the cafeteria we've got a really giant uh, LED screen that just shows every time a message or a post is sent and honest to God it looks like the synapses of a brain. And in a sense what that is is just a pulse of conversations, real authentic conversations going on back and forth around the world. So I couldn't figure out how to do a screen grab, we tried. So I ended up with this kind of Superman planet thing. 
but I hope that you get the idea that this is really powerful and like the global village, it's part of something much bigger, but it's meaningful to the person who's made that comment or who's connected with either a cause or a brand. So the links between the people and the objects they choose to connect with are the social graph. And you know, we, we've been at this for five years. And when Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook, he didn't really have this in his head. He didn't say, wow, I'm going to go and build this thing called the social graph. It's evolving. And we are inspired by the past. But mostly, we are a technology company that are enabling this. And what we're doing is enabling what we see users trying to do. We try to anticipate as much as possible, but imagine that it's not really us. There is only one social graph, and the social graph isn't Facebook, it's you. It's everything you choose to do, every conversation you choose to have. So that's kind of a, a, a huge opportunity for a marketer. But you have to remember that it's real identities, it's authentic, and it moves really, really fast. So as we move forward and we try to make it easy for both people and marketers, we recognize that people aren't online all the time. In fact, they could be, I think I'm missing a page here, sorry. They could be on any device, any device at all. They could be on a cell phone, they could be on this Game Boy, for example. We want Facebook to be everywhere. And an interesting statistic for those of you who are marketing to the Canadian audience, we tend to use Facebook on the more mobile platform more than anybody else. We're just a, we've just tended to really embrace social wherever we are. So that means snapping a photo if I'm at a family event. And I'm going to post that right away from my Blackberry or from my cell phone so that my friends can see it. So we want to be able to help people share information wherever they are, whenever they are. So what does this mean for marketers? What you see on the screen in front of you is a traditional marketing funnel. And up at the top, when, when I talked earlier about some of the challenges of digital marketing, and, and I, I didn't get any response from the audience, but often when we're in at agencies, we get lots of nods about the frustration, clients frustrated with agencies because agencies have a challenge trying to bring a message together or provide reporting. It's, it's you know, unfortunately, digital marketing is, is difficult to manage. This is what the world sort of looked like about two and a half, three years ago. You've got awareness at the top, and you've got search really at the bottom. The bottom is where transaction happens, and this is where Google dominates and where they've done a terrific job, and I would argue where they've changed everything for a lot of marketers. But all of that in the middle, so the consideration, those long-term relationships and engagement, nobody was really there. And this is where we believe that Facebook can play. And this is where we've really started to play in a big way. So Facebook is a place where you can build your brand. And I want to show you some examples. And what I've chosen to do today is to show you some examples of how offline media companies are embedding. Because I really want to get the message through that we're a platform. We're not a media company. So I'm sure that, geez, unless you were under a rock, you, there was, that would be the only way that you didn't know the role that Facebook played in Obama being elected. He's maybe not so happy at being president the last couple of weeks, but by and large, I mean, this guy has been a media darling. And Facebook played a really important role in that, not just in fundraising, not just in building that awareness, but go, if we go back up to this funnel, he drove consideration and he drove awareness, but most importantly, he drove that engagement with the voters of the United States. Then traditional media jumped on board to become part of the conversation. So how many of you saw or went online or saw any of the news reports about what happened on the night of the election with CNN? So just a couple of, so I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of background. What you can do as a broadcaster or as a publisher of a site is that you can implement some of the applications that we have. We have one called Connect. This is sort of a derivation of Connect. But you can actually bring the Facebook conversation onto your website. And that drives engagement for your brand. And what happened here at CNN, as they were reporting all of the election results, you logged on and you could see your friend list and you could see what people were commenting as they posted comments. But you weren't on Facebook, you were on CNN. 
So you had this incredibly robust experience where you were part of the election, but you were seeing your little post office, your little piece of the world. And you could communicate back and forth with your friends on CNN. Um, if anybody's interested afterward, I, I have some case studies, some from MTV as well, uh, where, you know, it's, it's, it's really, to me, it's very inspiring and it, it's really exciting to see how platform and media are coming together. But the heart of all this is authentic conversations. So here's another one. Um, this is a, really more of a doctored screenshot, so it didn't look like this, but this was an implementation really with the Jonas Brothers. And media is grasping onto this in a really big way to fill some of the gaps that they have in reaching out and encouraging loyalty. So you can see here that here are all my friends on the right-hand side of the people who were watching, and you can see their comments. So this was just a blown up screenshot to give you a better idea of what can go on. These are called live implementations. And you're going to see us do more and more of this as we move forward. But I would say to you, don't just think about this as some big, massive opportunity for a broadcaster. Any marketer, anybody with a corporate website, any publisher can have a Facebook Connect implementation. And it can drive this engagement and this honesty. So in the case of a broadcaster, in this case, they really cared about leveraging Facebook to drive TuneIn. But let's say this ad was not for the NHL. Somebody give me a, um, an example of one of the, the industries that you work in. Telecommunications. So telecommunications, price point driven industry. If you wanted to swap out this ad, you were launching a product or a new price point, you could, inside someone's fa Facebook homepage, you could have an ad with an offer on it where you could engage immediately, so that's drive to purchase. You could also put a poll up, which is a really great way to use Facebook as a method of testing the, the social waters, because think about this. The highest rated TV show in Canada gets a cumed reach of about three and a half million. On Facebook, you're gonna reach double that on any day, six million. So what a super opportunity. If you're a marketer, don't just think about this platform as an advertising. You can use it for market research. We have examples of where Johnson & Johnson in the US did market research for uh, a new product and launched a new sweetener because of what they learned off polling ads. So the point that I'm trying to make in this is that you can drive not only awareness, but you can drive engagement and participation. And the really exciting thing is that this message, in this particular case, the Leafs and the Sabres, if I said I'm gonna watch that, and I click on that ad, all my friends see it. So it's really powerful. So on that note, I wanna talk about some keys to social marketing, because this is kind of the big question that everybody always asks. First of all, people say, oh, I don't see any ads on Facebook. That's because the ads are part of the content and part of the social graph. But when we talk about the keys to social marketing, we're going to start with things that you ought to stay away from. So these are sort of some best practices from Facebook's perspective. I'm going to ask you to start by thinking about social media and say, it's not social media, it's social marketing. So I've said that Facebook isn't a media company, it's a technology or a platform company. So you need to think of Facebook in terms of building your brand. And it's building your brand for the long term. So the second point is stop thinking about campaigns or flights. Think about being strategic. Think about the long term. The reason this is really important is if you build a fan page and you run a campaign and you get a ton of engagement and you end up with those 130,000 fans and they've raised their hand and they've opted in to communicate with you and to be part of your brand, and then at the end of the campaign you stop talking to them, that doesn't make any sense. So think about what a fundamental shift that is for you as marketers and ad agencies. You have to now start thinking about the brand in the long term, which is the way marketers think about brands. And brand marketers really are responsible for driving product. So I would argue that this is an opportunity to bring the marketing message closer into what the way companies work anyway. It is not about a series of campaigns. It is about 
relationships. And for those of you who are direct marketers, you're probably quietly applauding. That is the notion of customer relationship management. It's what we've been doing with direct mail forever. So just as much as Marshall McLuhan's 1960 clip was relevant, many marketing practices that have been best practices forever can be beautifully transferred into this new world. You just need to bring all of this together. The third thing is don't use old metrics to define success. And you know, I'm actually going to refer even to clicks as old metrics. Clicks is something that you probably needed to use in that world at the top of the funnel because the only thing you could tell was, geez, if someone clicks on the ad, I know they've seen my message. And how many of us have sat there at night going, oh, so what does a click mean? What's the value of a click? It's a really big question. In the social media world, what happens is that you can actually see a couple of levels down what's happening with the relationship that you establish. So if you're a data geek, and I actually love data, the spreadsheets from the reporting you, will put you in heaven. Because remember something very important, we're a registration-driven company. That means that we know your real name. We talked about how important authenticity is. If I were to change my photo and put a picture of some hot babe up, every single one of my friends and colleagues would laugh and call me out on that. So you can't actually lie in an authentic world. If you do, you won't have any friends. Or everyone will certainly call you out on it. So from a marketing standpoint, when people say, ooh, you know, social marketing, we're just testing it, I would suggest to you that you need to think about this in the way that you've always thought about marketing. Except in this case, you are going to have a lot more data at the end of it. But don't use those campaigns. Don't think about campaigns and really try to bring in all of the data that you have. Some of your direct marketing campaigns will work so beautifully on this. And it's a terrific opportunity to take things that didn't work in the digital world before and bring them into the digital world. So now what do we focus on? So let's look at, these are some best practices on the plus side. The first one is leverage the social graph. I hope I've been able to communicate to you what the social graph is and why it's so important. It doesn't matter whether you have a local brand or a global brand. Being part of that social graph means that you've taken a message from here and hopefully it's gone viral. If you have a really good message and a really great offer, your message can reach a lot of people. So our vision at Facebook is that every product and every brand in the world would have an opportunity to have a presence on Facebook and that users can connect, they can opt in, raise their hand and connect with you. As I said earlier, these conversations are happening with you or without you. The second thing is, be brave enough to shape your brand, not build it. If you try to force the conversation, that's not authentic. And for, you know, we often at Facebook in Canada, we're, we're really proud of the fact that one of the most advanced social marketers in the world is the Toronto Dominion Bank. That is not a sexy brand. What they do is pretty serious. If any of you haven't seen what they're doing on Facebook, I suggest that it's a really great place to look. And I, I bring them out because for those of you who work at traditional companies, financial institutions, insurance companies, etc., there may be this notion of, of pressure internally. Oh, we can't do that to our brand. Yes, you can. Absolutely, you can. And your brand is going to be better off for it. Think back to the stuff I talked about before, that ongoing conversation. But not only that, be authentic. Because guess what? If they're not talking about your brand on Facebook, they're blogging about it somewhere else. So be part of the conversation. The third thing is get started. And most importantly, iterate. How many of you were really irritated when we changed our homepage at, in the spring? Right. So we iterate nonstop, and admittedly, we make mistakes. What we're saying is that the, the web, especially now, considering that this is a platform, and you are going to control what your message looks like in this platform world, we change our product every week. We iterate, we learn, there's data there. You need to do the same thing. But again, not on a campaign by campaign basis. Learn and know that you're going to make mistakes. 
Fourthly, develop a conversational calendar. And this is something I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on, but it's, it's something that we've done to help marketers stop looking at the world from campaign A to sustaining to campaign B. And we can certainly come in and talk to you about what a conversational calendar is. But you know, when you look at these four things, they're not that big a deal, but I would suggest that they're really different than the way we probably currently buy. The only difference would be search. For those of you who are smart search marketers, you learned long ago that you can't just buy a bunch of keywords, step out, and come back in. You gotta keep it going. So as much as I think search started to really revolutionize digital marketing, we're definitely taking that to the next level through authenticity, recency, and trust. And that is really the opportunity for you as marketers. So on that note, I'm gonna close out and I'm gonna say that I really appreciate your time. It's never, never easy. It's always intimidating to have to present to marketers because you know your business, I don't, and I really appreciate your time and thank you very much.